Hey, happy Friday. This week, Apple made the FBI angry with their new encryption technology. TSMC decided to triple down on manufacturing chips in Arizona in the US. And there's a whole new type of battery technology that is getting mass manufactured starting now as well. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream together with my streaming service, Nebula. Okay, the brief this week starts with some new Google Pixel Fold renders from OnLeaks. I'm getting Opal Find N vibes with this being more of a wider versus a taller foldable. It looks really cool, and I hope it actually comes out soon at a reasonable price too. Elsewhere, three new smartphone series launched this week. First, the global launch of the Realme 10 Pro series, which has a curved 120Hz display for about $320, not bad. Second, there was the Techno Phantom X2 Pro. Pro that has a retractable camera that physically moves in and out of the housing to reduce the size of the camera bump. And third, the iQ11 series, which launched in China as the first phones with the brand new Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 and 200 watts of fast charging as well. A pretty aggressive week for the Chinese players. Also this week, Dyson finally announced its first audio product in the Dyson Zone air purifying headphones, which cost an insane $949, and they look really dumb. Okay. Then Google released their year in search for 2022, covering top searches of the year, and the top term was apparently Wordle. Uh, okay. There are, of course, a lot more fun trends than just that, and I've left the link to the full report down in the description. Next, Microsoft agreed to a 10-year deal to bring Call of Duty to Nintendo for the first time and offered Sony and Steam the same deal too, which they did mostly to show the world that, hey, them buying Activision, the company that is making Call of Duty, will totally not mean that they will become monopolistic a-holes, but their move didn't quite work because just yesterday, Day, the FTC disagreed and is now suing to block Microsoft's purchase. See you all in court, I guess. And finally, Apple's self-repair program is now not just in the US, but is also expanding to a few more countries in Europe, so we can now source genuine Apple parts for a few iPhones and Macs as well. Nice. Okay, that's it for the brief, and my first story of the week is going to be TSMC doubling and maybe even tripling down on manufacturing chips in the US, and all the US parties from private companies to politicians getting maybe a little bit too carried away with what that actually means for the US. So the concrete news is that TSMC has officially tripled its overall investment commitments into their new chip fab in Arizona, bringing the figure up to $40 billion, up from previously 12. And the firm has confirmed that it will make 4 nanometer chips by 2024 in one fab and in another fab 3 nanometer chips by 2026. When complete, the two fabs would have a capacity of more than 600,000 wafers per year, though TSMC did say that it wouldn't quite be easy, citing a lack of trained personnel. Arizona is already home to one of Intel's major chip fabs, so I guess the goal is to start a major ecosystem in this region. And in fact, everyone from Tim Cook to Joe Biden was in Arizona to proudly celebrate the return of US chip manufacturing and to declare that the Signature Chips Act was totally working. They will construct a second fab here in Phoenix to build chips, three nano chips, the three nano chips, chips that are three nano, and you know what I'm saying. <laughs> nano no no, I don't know. And meanwhile, AMD and Nvidia have claimed that they are looking to buy US sourced chips from this plant too. So that all sounds great, right? America is on its way to true chip independence. Well, actually, maybe both yes and no. This TSMC commitment is a big deal, but these fabs are actually going to be at least a generation or two behind what the company makes in Taiwan when they come out, even if they hit all their targets. And their full capacity a few years from now will make up less than 5% of what TSMC is currently actually pumping out of their fabs right now, while the company also plans to keep all the critical central R&D and planning in Taiwan as well. In other words, these fabs might supply like last gen Apple watches or something like that, but hardly a brand new complete iPhone series, for example. 
Apple in particular is generally reportedly trying to diversify its supply chain out of China and Taiwan overall, but progress is very slow for them and the made in America chest thumping is maybe a little bit premature. Still, this is a major step for the US, especially when Samsung and Intel are working to expand their capacities in the US as well. Okay, and my second story of the week is going to be the world's first mass production of sodium ion batteries, which is no small thing. The world's biggest battery maker, Ketel, said that it had made commercially successful sodium ion batteries in mid-2021, but that hasn't scaled to production yet. But now we've learned that another supplier out of China, called Haina Battery, has reportedly reached its initial 1 gigawatt hour of annual capacity and is now shipping batteries. Sodium ion batteries are similar in their structure to lithium ion ones, but they use different materials. And the trade-off is that the sodium ones are cheaper, non-flammable and more environmentally friendly while the lithium ones are a little bit lighter and more dense. You can watch my dedicated tech author video about battery technologies somewhere here, but the point is that sodium ion batteries are really good for applications that don't need to be super, super dense, maybe a power wall at home or maybe a car that's kind of cheaper, while lithium ion batteries are better for the really high end stuff and the really small stuff like maybe smartphones. And indeed, Chinese car maker BYD also announced that it is testing its smallest EV hatchback in two variants, a cheaper sodium ion based solution with less range and the higher cost lithium option with more range. Nice. Okay, and for my last story of the week, Apple made some new privacy moves, which the FBI was unhappy about and the Electronic Frontier Foundation was really happy about. And that's generally a really good sign. So Apple announced that it will optionally allow users to have fully encrypted iCloud backups, along with photos, notes, and more, rolling out in 2022 globally, and surprisingly even in China, although they're only by 2023. They are explicitly saying that this is end-to-end -end encryption for your cloud stuff, which would be really surprising, especially in China, but we'll see the actual details very soon. Not only that, there's also going to be an iMessage feature for users to verify that they're messaging only with the people that they intended to, the spot hackers, kind of like with Signal. Plus, Apple accounts will now support hardware security keys like YubiKeys, and as a cherry on top, Apple has also officially given up on launching its previously announced very controversial CSAM detection tool for inappropriate child material in iCloud photos. All of these things have been a little overdue, like especially the hardware security key stuff. I didn't imagine that any modern account solution like the Apple accounts would not support them by now, but I guess there we are. Still, all of the moves are into the right direction for both security and privacy, so I think it's a good thing. Competitors like OneDrive and Google Drive have offered some level of encryption for some files, but Apple's push is a major one. And meanwhile, the FBI said in a statement that it is deeply concerned with the threat that end-to-end -end encryption and user-only access encryption pose, and that they request lawful access by design. Fun. The delayed rollout in China, plus Apple's history of allowing the Chinese government to have much more access to user data than to governments around the world outside of China, makes me think that the Chinese rollout will be somehow different, but uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Altogether, these features should make it significantly harder for either rogue hackers or government entities to spy on people using their gadgets, which is nice. Now, spying is obviously one of the earliest use cases that initially drove the adoption of encryption, of secret communication, and even the miniaturization of components. In fact, did you know that smartphone-sized cameras that you could fit into any number of hidden objects existed during the Cold War already? The history of spy gadgets, both in the real world and in movies through franchises like James Bond, are a super interesting topic, and it's what the latest episode of Technorama, my Nebula original series, is all about. We look through the films from the early days all the way to today to track and analyze gadget trends and to compare them with what happened in the real world to see what is realistic and to find out how audience interests have shaped the movies and their gadgets over time. This is the fourth and last episode of season two, so you now have eight full episodes from two full series of Technorama Online, each of which dives into another movie category trope. We have an episode about science fiction's obsession with circular space stations, Japanese mecha robots, and jetpacks, just to name a few. And if you like science fiction and film analysis, we've got more than two hours of highly produced nerdy deep dives from yours truly. I hope you check it out. Nebula is of course our very own premium video streaming site built and owned by educational creators, and your subscriptions on there allow us to fund whole new series like Technorama. 
Better yet, you can get a subscription to Nebula for free if you sign up to my sponsor CuriosityStream using my link in the description. Be sure to use that link, otherwise Nebula is not included in the price. And CuriosityStream is of course the home to fantastic online documentaries about science, history, nature and more, with the whole bundle of two services being super affordable at $15 for an entire year. That's easily the best deal in streaming for two whole services. I hope you check it out and I'll see you next Friday.